Wow, a, a small crowd in studio and everything. It's wonderful. Good morning, everyone, and, and, and what a pleasure to be out of the house and here. Uh, so in January this year, two short months ago, I turned 50. And, and in my 50 years, I've lived four lives or four careers. And it began when I was 13. At the age of 13, with the blessing of my parents, I left school and joined a very high control religious group to go off and save the world, where I spent the next 25 years. And after a bit of an awakening at the age of 38, I, I found myself leaving with my, with my wife and my son out into the big wide world with no education, a quarter of a million rand in debt, and no clear idea of where I was going to go or what I was going to do with the, with the life that now stretched out before me. And over the period of the next five years, I slowly built a life and built a career as a conference speaker, um, a, a professional keynote speaker, while on the weekends having a gig as a, as a secular marriage officer. And then in 2019, I got quite fascinated with and interested in, in professional esport, video games, competitive video games, and got quite involved with that and became, of all things, a shoutcaster, a commentator for competitive esport. And all of this was possible because of the world we now find ourselves in and how it is being shaped by technology, provided the possibility and the capacity to completely reinvent. The, the ability to fairly easily forge global networks in three different industries and build a brand and have some measure of success has only been possible because we live in a world that is globally connected and because of the technology that has shaped that world. And we've always been curious. Humans are curious. It's, it's genetically coded in us to be curious. And because we are, our early ancestors emerged from Africa and managed to move to just about every continent in the world over the period of about 10,000 short years because we always wanted to know what was over the next hill. We were curious about what was on the horizon, so we went to it, and when we got there, we saw there was further world, more to explore and to understand, so we went further, and then we got to the ocean, and we went, there's got to be something on the other side, so we thought about and developed technology to help us traverse the ocean, to get over to the other side. And as we began to understand and conquer the world around us, of course, we would look up to the stars and go, well, what's that all about? Where, what are those things? How do we know and understand more about that? And all of this curiosity and drive to conquer and understand the world and the universe in which we live culminated in what for me is the best photograph ever taken. This photograph here, in 1977, two space probes were launched, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, and their job was to go and explore the planets beyond Mars, which we didn't have too much information on, Jupiter, Saturn, um, and, and further beyond that. So off they went, and Voyager 1, after traveling for 14 years and 6 billion kilometers on Valentine's Day in 1990, it turned around and took this photograph. This is a picture of Earth from six billion kilometers away. And it, and it is just, it encapsulates the boldness of humans and, and our species to understand our universe, but it is also a great lesson in perspective. If you think about all the problems you have right now, all the stresses, anxieties, all the people you hate, all the people you love, all the people that annoy and frustrate you, every dictator, every hero, every villain, every humanitarian, everything that has ever gone on on this planet at any time has happened on that tiny blue dot. As Carl Sagan said, a speck of dust suspended in a sunbeam. So that has brought us pretty much to where we are now. We are living in a time of massive transformation. This century has been more transformative than any that has gone before. Everybody alive today is experiencing more transformation than anyone who has come before, and probably your children. And Vumi, we were talking, you've got a three-month-old daughter. She will experience more transformation than we are experiencing now, and that is because of our continued drive and thrust to understand. So in the last 50 years or so, we've, 
we've entered the technological age, which, which has become faster and, and in, increasing the, increased the pace of transformation. And that's pretty be, much been responsible for these five things. Computing, communication, connectivity, collaboration, and convergence. The 1970s was all about computing. In 1973, the microprocessor was invented, which allowed computers to go from the size of the studio we're in now, was a fairly small computer, to now what we carry around with us in every moment of every day. And, 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 and computing has completely altered how we interact with the world, how we engage with it, the ability to communicate with anyone anywhere driven by the computing technology. The 1980s was all about communication. The mobile phone... And there are, at the age of 50, I can remember a time that if you wanted to talk to someone on the phone, they had to be at their desk or they had to be at home. If they weren't in one of those two places, you were not going to talk to them on the phone. The mobile phone freed that, the ability to communicate wherever you were. And, you know, by the end of the 1980s, there were 5 million cell phone subscriptions. Today, there are 5 million new ones every day, more and more people gaining access to the ability to communicate globally. And that has had a fundamental shift in how we live our lives, do business, and go about the activity of being human and living. The 1990s, all about con connectivity because of the internet. The mid-90s saw, saw the internet go global. Well, in a sense, I mean, if we think about 1995, there were 16 million online users. We're about to hit 5 billion sometime this year, maybe. Um, and, and very soon, everybody is going to be connected all the time. Suddenly, access to information, access to global networks, again transformed how we live, how we engage, how we date, how we meet each other, how we break up, how we do live every part of our lives. And then the 2000s were about collaboration. Social media arrived, the ability to interact socially with people no matter where they were. And, and, uh, and then in the, the 2010s, the period leading up to 2020, we saw the convergence of all of these, the computing, communication, connectivity, the collaboration all converged into one place, which was pretty much the devices we, we carry with us. And then 2020 arrived, and without going into depth about how bizarre the last two years have been, we'd arrived in a time of intelligent technology. Up to this point, technology had always been a utility, something that helped us get something done, helped us to do our jobs easier, helped us to get things done quicker and faster. But we now saw the emergence of personal technology that was smart, that came to be shaped around us. I mean, if you think about the phone you have, all of us have, have a device that we are intensely connected to. And you might have exactly the same phone as another person, but you would never swap phones because even though technologically they're the same thing, they are very much personal devices. It's all been sorted the way you like it. It's got your playlists. It's got your YouTube history. It's got your photos. And even if those photos aren't in any way risque, you still are very protective of it because it is personal. And that is intelligent technology. And, and the period we're in now where it's all being shaped, we are able to mold technology around us rather than just using it as a tool. So we've lived in this time of transformation, massive transformation. The last two years have been sort of hyper-transformation where already high-paced accelerated change became very quick within the matter of weeks. And everyone you speak to, I mean, we are talking to Enrico this morning from multimedia and, and the change they had to go through. An events industry, events company living in a world where suddenly no events were happening. So we've all been forced into transformation uh, very quickly, and we've seen massive change in the last two years. So if we look at some of the things of, of, of how this has shaped us, how we find ourselves where we are now, and where it might likely be taking us, let's talk about our kids. And if you have kids that are about this age, which is what, 9, 10, 11 years old, maybe 12, the first thing to know is um, these are digital natives. These are people who have been born into a world of technology. They haven't had to learn it. It isn't something new and amazing. We as adults are often really impressed by technology. Your kids are not because it's always been around them. And, 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 and they simply couldn't imagine a world or a life where this didn't exist, where they don't have, wouldn't have, don't have the access that has become the norm. So let's look at some things that have changed. Obviously, 
virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, working from home, uh, remote work had been a topic of conversation in corporate circles for a couple of decades. And there were moves, minor moves here and there. Suddenly and instantly it became a thing. Uh, and very quickly it was realized that, A, people will actually do work if they're at home all day. In fact, they'll probably work a lot harder. They'll probably work too hard. And that brought its own problems, problems we wouldn't have, wouldn't have guessed at or thought at, the kind of the burnout. How do you separate your work and your professional life when you're working from home? But this is now with us. It's a part of life, and we need to solve its problems as we go forward. And then one of voice technology. I, you know, I, I, I talk to my phone often. If I have questions, I'll give it an OK Google, and now my phone's going to go off, I realize. Um, but you, you access, we're accessing technology with our voice. But this is going to, and every time you do it, the technology behind it, the AI that drives it gets a little smarter. It learns more about the things you like, how you ask for the things you like, what you, your accent, the way your, your voice moves and, and alternates when, you, when you're talking. And because of this, it'll become even more and maybe in a, almost in a scary way, attuned with you and your life. And it is very possible within a few short years that you will be able to ask Google or Siri or whichever, whichever system you use, you'll be able to ask and say, you know, I'm dating two people. Which of these two is a better fit for me? And the AI driving this will be able to say, well... I know how much time you've spent with each of these two people. I know what your heart rate was doing while you were spending time with each of these two people. I can tell you how you felt after you spent time with them, based on what you wrote in your own journal or posted on social media. I can tell you the financial prospects of the two people you're dating or, or, or are looking to date because I've got access to what they're doing and their lives and their timelines. And based on all of this information, I can tell you that person A will be a better fit for you. And in fact, I know you so well that I even know that you wished I had said person B. But you have a 14% better chance with the first guy. So that's where this is likely to go. Personal technology, intelligent technology. But whatever the technology, however we look at it, we know that our lives are dominated by uh, it's, it's all around us. It surrounds us in every part of every day, from, from the mobile phones to the Zoom calls to our interaction at work to ordering a pizza to ordering anything, anything that we want. It is ever present. And within this, there are outstanding opportunities, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But it does come with its own issues in terms of how, how we think about the present and the immediate and the more midterm future and how we how we choose to navigate it how we choose to look for the opportunities but n navigate the potential pitfalls as well and that brings us to okay where are we likely to go and of course the whole move with personal technology intelligent technology will continue and then a word you are going to come to hear lots about and probably have already is the word metaverse and you're going to hear it so much that you're going to come to hate it and it's not it's going to come to probably not mean much but it is it does describe where this is all taking us and and it comes out of pretty much out of the world of gaming Having said that, though, there are some serious business efforts to bring a business angle, not just a gaming angle, to it. And we see that effort from Facebook, now called Meta, and it's very important that we, that we separate that Facebook is not the metaverse. Um, and then Microsoft as well. Uh, they are making a massive business push and a gaming push to build a future metaverse. So what is this? Think of the internet in which you are completely immersed and uh, where, where everything you do happens inside. And, and this was probably best described in a 2019 movie called Ready Player One. If you haven't read the book or seen the movie, I highly recommend you do it. But watch the movie first and then read the book. Uh, and it postulates a future in 2045. So 23 years from now. The hero of the story is born in the year 2027, so a time that hasn't even arrived. And probably, I'm going I'm to play you a minute and a half of the intro of this film to give you a concept of what at least a 2020 vision of what the metaverse might be would look like.
My parents, they didn't make it through those times. So I live here in Columbus, Ohio with my Aunt Alice. In 2045, Columbus is the fastest growing city on earth. It's where Halliday and Morrow started gregarious games. These days, reality is a bummer. Everyone's looking for a way to escape. And that's why Halliday, that's why he was such a hero to us. He showed us that we could go somewhere without going anywhere at all. You don't need a destination when you're running on an omnidirectional treadmill with quadraphonic pressure sensitive underlay. James Halliday saw the future and then he built it. He gave us a place to go, a place called the Oasis. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. You can do anything. Go anywhere. Like the vacation planet. Surf a 50-foot monster wave in Hawaii. You can ski down the pyramids. You can climb Mount Everest with Batman. Check out this place. It's a casino the size of a planet. You can lose your money there. You can get married. You can get divorced. You can, you can go in there. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay because of all the things they can be. Tall, beautiful, scary, a different sex, a different species, live action, cartoon. It's all your call. Yeah, that's me. Well, that's my avatar. At least until I feel like changing. Except for eating, sleeping, and bathroom breaks, whatever people want to do, they do it in the Oasis. So that's a vision of what a metaverse might be. And as you can see from that clip, very much driven out of the world of gaming. And I'm sure by the time we get to 2045, we'll look back at this movie and go, wow, how wrong they got it. But it's certainly a vision of what it might be. And where we are now with the meta universe, uh, the metaverse, if you take the clip you've just seen, today's metaverse pretty much looks like this. Uh, where we're trying to improve on Zoom calls and Teams meetings by having animated cartoon character representations of ourselves sitting around a boardroom. So there's a long way to go, but this is going to have a greater and greater impact on our lives personally and our lives professionally as we go forward. So it makes sense to at least get some sort of understanding of it now. Much of what is being envisioned is coming out of the world of gaming because gaming dr has driven the whole concept of global communities and how they interact with one another. And, and as you get into the world of gaming, one of the first things you'll do is have a gamer name or a gamer tag, an in-game name, the identity by which you are known inside a particular game. And this will be a fact in the metaverse. We will have our metaverse identity. How does that mesh? with our real life identity, our professional identity. These are gonna be questions we're all confronted with. How do we bring our personal values to our online, our, on, our, our digital identity? So my chosen game, the game I've sort of specialized in, is a game called Rocket League, and you'll, you'll, there'll be a video about it later. But, and so I chose as my on, online identity, my in-game name is Greybeard, for the obvious reason, and it works quite well. But I, I want to have a quick chat about a guy in the game of Rocket League called Happy Meal. And this is, this is, this is his car within the game of Rocket League. And he plays for a, he's a professional Rocket League player. He plays for a team called Bravado. And, uh, and, as, and as you watch the clip that's coming up, I wanna, want you to think about who Happy Meal might be. Who is this person? In late January, early February, there was a regional Sub-Saharan Africa Rocket League tournament, which Bravado won, and this is them on their, on their way 
to winning that tournament. Yeah, well, since that opening goal off the kickoff, they've, they've looked to find the... Oh, my word! Happy Meal! Almost out of nowhere, the dunk down. Daisy popping it forward. Happy Meal in the midfield, picks it up, finds the double. We saw a mistake there. Snowy and Darth both double, uh, double committing on an attack playing forward, which immediately put them under pressure. The shot, though, was missed, but not this time. Happy Meal hitting the crossbar just moments ago. This time, with the work started from Dodai, for the intercepts falls beautifully for happy he drops it straight down for the african bouncer two minutes and 20 seconds was the last overtime between oh. these two bravado taking it down to die for we'll seal it they have beaten the mighty orlando pirates they win the upper bracket final so the the first thing to know there is that orlando pirates have a Rocket League team. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the people who work for Orlando Pirates are not sure. Don't, didn't know that they have a Rocket League team. So Happy Meal and his team Bravado, the three of them, it's Happy Meal, Daisy and, and uh, To Die For, won this tournament. And it has to be said that winning that tournament meant that that team, that team of three people, won 75,000 rand for a weekend's worth of work, playing about six games of Rocket League, each of them about five minutes each. So, they, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty good payday for them. But who is Happy Meal? As you watch that, I, I don't know in your head who you imagine this might be. But so after winning, they interviewed Happy Meal. And this, this is a short clip of him being interviewed. And I have to ask, just how are you feeling right now? Um, firstly, thank you for uh, congratulating me. Uh, secondly, I'm feeling it's awesome. Honestly, like you know, it's it's really tough. Uh, not tough, but it's it's hard coming into into the, the games. And the costs always say, pirates can't be beat. You know, they don't lose. <laughs> they don't lose. You know, that's uh, it's tough hearing that. But I mean, it's it's completely factual. You know, like it's they, that is that is the record they've they've been holding. So to take that record away from them, that's uh, that feels pretty good, pretty special. So. There you go, Happy Meal doing his job, sitting in his bedroom, much like many of us sitting at home doing their work online. Uh, Happy Meal, by the way, is 22 years old. He, he lives in Joburg. His teammates both live in Cape Town and had not met. These people have never met each other in real life, but they're part of a competitive online scene. And uh, imagine now, so that's gaming global community, people gathered together around the passion for a particular game. And Rocket League is a very niche game. There are far bigger games with far greater communities with a lot more money involved. And, uh, but imagine this growing out where you're in a, in a game and instead of uh, instead of leaving the game to go do other things like order a pizza, imagine being able to do it in-game. That becomes the metaverse. Being able to go from that to another game, to engage with other communities, that is what the metaverse becomes. And now it is possible to buy digital goods, which sounds bizarre. Everything in Rocket League can be purchased can be owned from the cars to the wheels on the cars to the decals everything about it inside rocket league the most the rarest car the most valuable car is this this is known as the titanium white octane and it is known as titanium white because of the white edging around it and you can own this in the game of rocket league for 1500 rand so and, and it is the most expensive car and it is the rarest and uh, but there are trading sites very active trading sites on which you can purchase it. And that might sound impressive, 1,500 Rand for a digital car that doesn't exist in the real world. Well, the boost, the, uh, what makes, makes it possible for your car to take off off the ground into the air in Rocket League is the boost. And that boost, which comes out of the back of the car, that one you see there is known as the Alpha Boost because in the Alpha version of the game played in 2014, 13 and 14, when they were testing out the game, everyone who played that version of it was given this boost and never again since then. So it is exceptionally rare and a lot of people want to own it. And you can, for 30,000 Rand, you could be the proud owner of a digital boost that doesn't exist, that, that uh, if you spend six hours a day playing Rocket League, maybe 40 people will get to see it. Uh, but it has value. 
Recently, we heard about MTN buying digital property inside a metaverse. So there are very early versions of it, and it will expand and become, uh, you know, your Vumi, your, your three-month-old daughter is going to grow up in part in the metaverse. Her teenage years, she's going to go to concerts online in the metaverse, fully immersed in virtual reality. And that's what's coming for us, the future that is, that is coming. We're living through a period of prolonged transition. Uh, if we look at the start of the century, it's been 22 years. It has all been about constant change and transition. And it, this is likely to go on for the better part of the rest of our lives. And there's no going back. There's no going to a simpler time, a simpler future. And that one of the functions of getting older is we often long for the glory days of how much better things were when we were kids. There is no going back to that. And we have to know and understand that and appreciate it. And you know, from the standpoint of our ancestors, your grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandparents, from their standpoint, we are living the dream. We're living in a time of refrigeration, of air conditioning, of global travel, of easy access to entertainment, to food, to anything we need. Everything we need, we have. Yet, so many of us don't feel like we're living that dream. In fact, there are a large number of us that are having mental health challenges around us. We're struggling, we're stressed, we're anxious. So why this contradiction? Why this dichotomy when we live in a time of more potential and possibility than we have ever experienced in the history of human civilization? Well, there's a couple of reasons for it. And the main one is that we are not coded for happiness. It's not part of our genetic code to be happy. It's not part of our genetic programming to be tranquil and have a peaceful mind. What we are coded for is to accumulate and to never be satisfied. And this, and this is why we've come to dominate the world as a species, is because we were never satisfied and we always looked to accumulate, to get more. And, and this makes sense. That programming, that drive makes sense when we're curious in a world where nothing much has happened and where there's threat around us all the time. If you got completely satisfied by your last meal, you would likely starve if you weren't immediately thinking about the next thing that had to be hunted down, the next uh, patch of whatever we could find to gather to eat. And when we spoke about accumulation, you know, back in those times, all you could accumulate was what you could carry in your two arms. But we now live in a world where it is possible to accumulate and then keep accumulating until we have large houses filled with stuff we don't even know we own, yet we want more. We're never satisfied. We're not satisfied with the job we have. We think if we just get that next job, the promotion will be happy. You get the promotion, you're instantly happy. And the next day you're already in a panic about losing that job and maybe getting the next one. That programming to accumulate and to never be satisfied is ill-equipped in a world where we have so much access, where there's so much immediacy around us. And that is what we need to start thinking about as we navigate the frenetic pace of the world we live in now and the world that is coming. And start manually programming ourselves toward being happy, programming ourselves toward being happy with what we have and focusing on what we can control. Ultimately, our weapon... And it's the difference between having constant mental health challenges rather than seeing opportunity at every turn, because that's what we should be doing. And that weapon is our reason choice, our, our own minds, the massive power of your own mind. And keep, remember that your mind is the only thing that you completely, truly own. Things can happen to your possessions. Your possessions can be stolen or lost or a natural disaster. Your body you don't even completely own because you can be arrested. You can get sick. All sorts of things that can happen beyond your control. But whatever happens to you in your life, you will always have your reason choice. The choice 
to make a choice about how you feel and how you think about whatever situation you find yourselves in. And there's a number of things around this that we gotta, that we gotta uh, think about. I mean, if you, part of the problem with the immediacy of technology is that everything is happening right now. So we feel that everything is important. And Twitter feeds, hash, uh, Instagram feeds are bizarre because you can have a tweet about the war in Europe right next to someone sharing their new profile picture or a cute picture of their, and they look exactly the same. How do you discriminate between the importance? The, the availability of access to everything. You know, we've always had insecurities. We've always been jealous about uh, friends or colleagues who might have more than us, but it's never been shoved in our faces so constantly where every time we pick up a phone, we see what somebody else has that we might desire. It's also because of that availability and access, this, this world has taught us that what other people think about us and whether they like a photo or what we're doing or a post, what they think about us matters. And, and that has the potential to make us miserable. So perhaps our reason choice should be, let's concern ourselves with what we can control? What are the things in your life that you can control? You cannot control what other people think about you. You cannot control the judgment of you, which happens all day, every day. But what can you control? You can do your job. Whatever that job is, whether you've decided to climb a corporate ladder or to go out and be an entrepreneur and make a dent in the universe on your own, what is your job? You can do your job, and how do you control that? You can't control what other people think about you, but you can control what you think about yourself, how you can advance yourself to learn, to understand, to embrace the future that is surrounding us. So concern yourself only with what you can control. And then perhaps, instead of being miserable about what you don't have, start to desire, start to want what you already have. And remember, from the standpoint of your ancestors, you are living the dream. You have everything they would have thought an abundant life would look like. You've got a place to be, to live, a sheltered place every single day. You're not going to have to physically go out and hunt something to eat. It's all there. If you need something, you have access to. Let's desire what we want, and then we don't start to fret about what we don't have. And this is by no means to say we shouldn't pursue greater things. Of course we should. But let's not cling to a future that we don't yet have. Let's understand the, the present that we have and how we can make it better for ourselves, our colleagues, our families, and those around us. But don't tie your happiness to your goals. Tie your happiness to what exists right here and right now. Part of what you can't control is the stupidity, the arrogance, the incompetence of other people. Sure, you can try and help correct where you can, but for the most part, you have no control about it. So don't stress about the faults of others. Think about your own and how you improve yourself. And then finally with our reason choice is let's find humanity in technology. The story of technology is a human story. And given the pace of technology and how quickly it is moving now, it is very easy to lose sight of that. Um, but behind every email address, every hashtag, every Twitter handle is another human being. And that human being is struggling as much as you are to find their place in the world, make sense of it, see opportunities where they can, but mostly to try and keep their head above water. And it makes no sense for us to be, it makes no sense for us to be struggling with it as much as we often seem to be struggling with it because the opportunities are there. So, if we choose to look for and find the opportunity, absolutely there. But we've got to get ourselves in the best shape to do it. So every time you see a tweet that makes you furious, whether that's about vaccines or load shedding or whatever it might be, you have a reason choice to make in that moment. Is your getting angry about it and involving yourself in that drama, is that going to enhance anything for anybody involved or yourself? In every situation is a reason choice. Your reason is your greatest weapon 
because it supersedes the coding that got us this far, the coding to gather and accumulate and to never be satisfied has got us this far. But with what is coming, it's going to make us miserable unless we move up to our reason choice and reprogram ourselves for a bit of happiness and for a bit of tranquility of mind. And the great news is that there's almost nothing you need to be tranquil and happy other than what you already have. And it is worth doing because it's a marvelous time we live in. I, the last 12 years, have been an incredible journey for me. It has blown me away that it has made it very real that anybody can build a brand, can make global networks, can do pretty much what they want to do. The potential and possibilities are there, but we've got to be in the best possible shape to do, it, to do it. And it is worth doing because there has never been a greater time to do great things. So go and do them. Do great things. Thank you very much. Thank you.